You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. My name is Brendan Cole. The British are not coming. Well, this time at least. The House of Commons last week ensured that when MPs voted against a government motion seeking support in principle for a targeted response to a suspected chemical attack by President Bashar al-Assad's forces in Syria. The evidence, if you believe the Western powers, seems to be building that chemical weapons were in fact used in the attacks near Damascus, which, according to some estimates, has left more than 1,400 people dead. France says it has satellite imagery showing the attacks coming from government-controlled areas to the east and west of Damascus and targeting rebel-held zones. This week, the world's biggest economies are meeting in St. Petersburg, where the Russian President Vladimir Putin will reportedly be urged to accept that Bashar al-Assad will have to step aside. But what will Britain's role be? The vote last week has been viewed by many as a victory for democracy, for a kind of antidote to the emotional baggage that followed the vote on the Iraq war. But has it sacrificed its influence in this conflict? And what will be the wider implications of the vote for the relationship between Britain and the United States? Well, to discuss this and the issues surrounding it, I'm pleased to be joined in the studio by the Conservative MP Brooks Newmarket, MP for Braintree. Also here is Kate Hudson. She's the General Secretary for the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. And in the studio here is James Boys. He's a Senior Visiting Research Fellow at King's College uh, London and an expert on American foreign policy. On the line, I'm joined by Nadim Sahawi, who's the MP for Stratford-on-Avon. Certainly the reaction last week, Kate Hudson, was it was a victory for democracy, it was a victory for parliament. But I mean, it's a strange kind of victory, I suppose, wouldn't you say, given that 1,400 people lie dead under the most appalling, horrific circumstances? Well, I think that everyone is really striving to arrive at a decision about what is the best thing to do to help the people of Syria. I think that people who've been against the attack certainly aren't cavalier in any sense about the death and destruction that's taking place in that country. The differences are, what is the best course of action to follow? Some people feel that surgical strikes on facilities in Syria will help that. Other people are concerned, obviously following Iraq and so on, that there's uh, not a clear exit strategy, that that might help other forces within Syria, that there may not be stability and, and advance for peace following that kind of attack. So I think that ru- many people feel, including myself, that rushing into that kind of attack without a clear exit strategy, without being convinced that that is the best outcome, surely it's sensible to pause and think about the implications of that and think about alternatives which might help the Syrian people. So for the CND, was it an issue of timing? It happened too fast. The facts weren't uh, able to be debated. Uh, in fact, we didn't have the interim report from the chemical weapons inspectors at the time of the debate. But but potentially your organisation could change its view on that? Well, I think that my organisation is unlikely um, to think that Tomahawk cruise missile attacks are going to be a positive contribution, but obviously I can't speak prior to the organisation making a kind of policy decision on any individual circumstance. But certainly now, uh, where we have a situation where at that time the UN's weapon inspectors hadn't concluded their investigations, it's not absolutely clear um, who's used the chemical weapons, would targeting weapons facilities actually knock them out and end their further use, are innocent civilians going to be affected, all those kinds of things. So I think uh, I, I certainly wouldn't want to give the impression that CND would say, well, actually, yes, OK, we'll support attacks next week. But certainly, I think for us and so many other people, there were many, many unanswered questions about the impact of an attack on Syria and whether indeed that would do anything to bring about peace and stability in the region. I think one of the things that we've found most positive is since that parliamentary decision, leading parliamentarians and political figures have been saying, right, now we really need to really make an impact impact in the region through diplomatic and political methods. Our view was, well, actually, that should have been the first port of call rather than thinking of cruise missiles as the first port of call. Brooks Newmark, there is that point, isn't there, that that punishing a dictator by killing more of his own people leads nowhere, especially uh, when there's a lack of any kind of 
particular strategy. It felt like a, a kind of gesture war in a way, mm. didn't it? My understanding is that the objectives were very clear. It was to degrade and neutralize uh, Bashar Assad's ability to use his military infrastructure to further slaughter and gas his own people. It, it was no more than that. It was not about boots on the ground. It was not about sending pilots up there. But, you know, I've spent time in the region meeting with opposition fighters, and I was there last week, and the message I got from General Idris and President Jarba, the head of the Syrian Opposition Council, was quite clear that if you vote in Parliament not to do anything, that sends a green light to Bashar Assad that he can continue slaughtering and gassing his own people with an impunity. And I'm afraid last Thursday's decision has done just that. Nadim Sahawi, do you agree with that? Does this send a message whether or not the efficacy of such a such an attack is is in question but certainly just the message that it sends is is one of that he can get away with it the assad regime has been pushing the envelope on the use of uh, sarin this isn't the first attack of course using chemical weapons um this is the 14th or 15th time albeit there were smaller deployments of, of chemical weapons you spoke about parliament and the victory for democracy as an observer and as a new boy in parliament i entered parliament in 2010 what i saw is many backbenchers are still reeling from trusting tony blair and you know following him through the the i lobby and voting for the iraq war in 2003 only to find that they were let down by the political interference on, on the intelligence evidence, and then, of course, getting absolutely sucked into a quagmire that is Iraq. That continues to deliver a lot of pain for many of my colleagues and for the country. I think David Cameron, um, again, was, was absolutely right to tackle this head-on, to talk about you know, the, the well-being poison of, of public opinion, because the people look at the Iraq campaign, and of course Afghanistan as well, and uh, uh, neither campaign is something that we have any appetite for. Indeed, I, as I said in my speech, the world's greatest power I don't think has the capability or the capacity to do nation building and boots on the ground in the way it attempted to do in Iraq. This isn't about having an exit strategy because we're not going to have an entry strategy. We're not going to have boots on the ground. It's about degrading and ridding the Assad regime from the capability of deploying these weapons. And I felt depressed that we, we will not participate because I recall in 1988 when Saddam Hussein gassed the Kurdish people and the world looked on in horror but did nothing. And of course that led to him invading Kuwait and then a much bigger uh, problem for the West. Of course, we did act in Iraq in 91 very successfully. John Major decided to protect the Kurdish and the Shia populations in Iraq when Saddam decided he was going to attempt to annihilate both nations. And we placed the no-fly zones over the, the, the north of Iraq and the south. And very clearly, with a defined campaign, John Major pledged to the country that they would not, we would not engage in regime change or nation building. And if you recall at the time, the Kurds decided to have their own civil war. We didn't get sucked in because we had a clear mandate that all we were going to do was police the no-fly zone. So I think there are examples where we've been able to act, been able to take out you know, some of these evil weapons of mass destruction without having to be sucked into a full-blown, you know, boots on the ground, nation-building exercise. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Brendan Cole. We're discussing the British role in solving the Syria conflict. With me in the studio is Kate Hudson, General Secretary for the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, James Boys, a Senior Visiting Research Fellow at King's College London, Brooks Newmark, Conservative MP for Braintree, and Nadim Sahawi. MP for Stratford-on-Avon. Can I just put that to uh, Kate Hudson? He, re he refers to the spectre of um, 1988 and uh, Saddam Hussein. That is the danger. Iran could take note of this. North Korea could take note of this. Well, I think that one does have to look at the wider context and also the historical context as well, because it's one thing to say, well, Britain should be involved in this because we need to remove the capacity of this dictator to uh, use chemical weaponry and so on. That, that's one question. And of course, that is a, a very, very serious question. But there are also issues about historically, what kind of role has the West played with regard to some of these leaders, these dictators in the region? What role have we had in arming them? What role have we had in things like chemical supplies? And indeed, what role do we have in terms of condoning the possession of nuclear weapons by some countries and not by others? You know, the sort of double standards around all those issues. Of course, look, of course, we've made mistakes in the past, and but that doesn't excuse, you know, if you can't solve every problem around the world, 
that doesn't mean you shouldn't act when you can and have the capability to, to, to take out these horrific weapons of mass destruction from a dictator that is slaughtering his own people. My personal view is that attacking Syria at the moment in this context with the limited amount of information that we have, with all the different factors on the ground, with the diffuse and disparate nature of the opposition, with the different elements globally and regionally that support the opposition, you know, do we have enough information about that and the impact of what such a strike would do and whether or not innocent, innocent civilians would be killed to come to a firm conclusion that that would be the right path to take. Clearly, our parliamentarians came to the conclusion that they did not have enough information to conclude that that was the right path to take. And I think, obviously, the fact that President Obama himself has now turned to Congress, he said he thinks that we should attack, they should attack uh, Syria, but he's turning that over to Congress because there has to be mm. a full democratic and open debate with all the information there. But I, I suggest it would be appropriate for countries that are thinking of attacking another country to think about their role in the region, what they do, blow back and consequences of previous policies and bear that in mind when they make the decision about this and any further decisions they might make about attacking any other countries. I'd like to touch on the congressional vote in a, in a minute, but I'd like to get the view of, of James Boys. And certainly, when we saw the vote in Parliament last week, you really did see benches of MPs bitterly ruining their decision over the Iraq War. How much of this is down to Tony Blair? I think there's a great deal at stake here. I think if you think about what it was that Tony Blair was accused of as being too presidential, effectively, and almost going uh, over the heads of Parliament, I think what you see with David Cameron was a deliberate attempt to try to to walk that back and to bring in Parliament so that there was a sense of of democratic principles being uh, brought back into play here. But if you want to make the argument that Iraq has very much overshadowed the debate in Westminster, then the same is very, very true in Washington, where you have an entire political dynamic which is overshadowed by Iraq. Mm -hmm. You've got an administration which is only in place because of Iraq, arguably. And I suggest to you that everything that Barack Obama has done has been done with a view to, well, what would W have done? I'll do the opposite, effectively. Uh, and what's fascinating, I think, I mean, Kate was talking about the idea of pushing this back to Congress. Um, why is he doing this? I mean, if you look back over decades and decades of presidential history, you see a power grab by the chief executive and a drawing towards the White House of executive action, especially in terms of foreign policy. And Obama, in a stroke, for what I think of political reasons, has decided to push this back to Congress in almost a, a move that harks back to the 1920s. There's been 14 or 15 uh, acknowledged strikes since Barack Obama's famous red line remarks. It's like, well, one must ask why the sudden rush to, to action now uh, ahead of the release of some of the uh, the documentation, such as the UN weapons report, report, which would have actually aided a potential incursion into some of these parts of the world, I think. Brooks Newmark, David Cameron did overplay his hand, calling back Parliament early for this vote ahead of this this information, this hard evidence that would, be, would, would have made the vote far more informed one, but certainly it's weakened his authority, hasn't it, on the international stage? Well, I guess I'd answer that twofold. First of all, if you actually look at the motion, the motion wasn't calling for action. The motion was saying, actually, let's wait to see what the UN inspectors said. I think the major difference between our motion and the Labour Party's one, which was pretty wafer thin, actually, was that our motion condemned Bashar Assad for what he was doing. There was the absence of any condemnation in the Labour motion that prevented us coming to, to an agreement on that. With respect to weakening the uh, Prime Minister's authority, actually, I disagree. I think, you know, he has a huge amount of respect out there, and certainly out on the Twitter sphere that I've been reading, for people to say, look, you know, we may disagree with him, but at least he came to Parliament. Let Parliament have its say, and has respected the democratic decision, and to use Kate's words, you know, based on the information that was available. If he'd waited uh, another 10 days, uh, the intelligence probably would become clear. The UN, which isn't there, by the way, to sort of point fingers as to who did this, is there to merely reaffirm that chemical weapons were indeed used. Well, you've got to have been living in a cave if you didn't know that chemical weapons were used in Ghouta 10 days ago. Nadim Sahawi, though, wasn't there the sense among the public, among the British public, that trust has been lost? Trust has been lost with, uh, with the Iraq experience. I think you're right to, to say that trust has been lost. I think, actually, what David Cameron did is probably the, the, the beginning of building those bridges back because if you examine what he said all along, he said, no decision has been made. Many of your colleagues in the media said, oh yeah, that's what Tony Blair said to us, but he'd already made a decision. This is just a rubber stamping exercise. But he actually made it. No decision had been made. And he came to Parliament with I 
a reasoned motion. You know, let's do all the things that you know, we can do before taking any action. And if we then decide to join a, a coalition to take action, let's have a second vote in Parliament. We, we almost needed that sort of action from an executive to begin the healing process with the nation, actually, that, that politicians, when they do say something, they mean it. So when Nick Clegg when Nick Clegg rules out going back for another vote, which he did yesterday, and it was raised by Boris Johnson yesterday morning, that's the last we'll hear of it in Parliament? Unless there is a significant change, I think it would be absolutely pointless to come back to Parliament. And, and in fact, it would, it, would, it would sort of help that process of erosion of trust if politicians just said, oh, right, well, we didn't like the result of the first vote, mm. let's just have another one. To the US now, uh, James Boyes, you're an American foreign policy expert. What do you make of this going back to Congress? There'll be a vote on Monday. John McCain has raised the possibility that if it doesn't pass Congress, it will make Barack Obama look weak. We've talked about how perhaps whether or not David Cameron has looked weak, but it may not make it through Congress. What will he do then? Well, I think it's a little too late to be worrying about making Barack Obama look weak personally. Since the day he announced that red line remark, which of course was during the height of a political campaign uh, for re-election, one wonders whether that might go down as much as uh, Gerald Ford's denial of Soviet invasions of Eastern Europe is a massive mistake on the campaign trail, quite frankly. He's been ruining the day that that was ever made, I think. Since then, as I mentioned earlier on, we've had 14 or 15 recognised attacks. The Obama administration have been trying to sort of hem and haw on this, just as the Clinton administration did when they denied genocide and talked about acts of genocide for example. I was wondering how he was going to get out of this. He's decided to play a political game I think and take this to Capitol Hill. There's absolutely no guarantee that that will get through for a number of reasons. One the Senate for example, the Democrats can't rely upon getting uh, the 60 votes to prevent the filibuster. In the House, which is adamantly opposed to President Obama full stop, uh, you've got a whole load of uh, congressmen who are going to be up for re-election within 12 months of the vote. The vote's going to take place during the week of the September 11th anniversary so I think there's an awful lot of ra- reasons about why this is going to be a very, very problematic move for the Obama administration. And if they don't want to proceed, it's an ideal way of getting out of this whilst retaining the moral high ground. So has it weakened the presidential prerogative, do you think? I think it's weakened the presidency, certainly, by... Uh, Clinton would never have done this. Reagan would never have done well, no, this. No, absolutely. Because if you think about this, if, if all we're talking about here is an armed strike by Tom Hawk cruise missiles and no one's talking about putting troops on the ground, uh, the precedent for doing this is, is, is hard to find, quite frankly. If you want to start a war... War, that's one thing. But if all we're talking about here is a series of airstrikes, Reagan certainly didn't do it, Bush didn't do it, and Clinton certainly didn't. So across the board, politically, uh, there's, lack of a, there's a lack of precedent for this. Kate Hudson, are you concerned that there's a degree of isolationism here on the side of the Atlantic and, and, and Britain voting for effectively military inaction? Our concern is for the way in which foreign and defence policies are conducted internationally to be conducted on what we would consider to be a more constructive level, which which is about mutual respect between nations, support for equal development amongst nations. I mean, things like just dealing with the refugee problems, for example, that have resulted from Iraq and Syria and so on. Um, we believe that there are different ways of conducting um, relations in the world. Now, obviously, some people think that it's, it's a negative thing if we decide not to bomb and not to be engaged militarily, that that's a sign of weakness. Well, I suppose in, in some people's eyes that might be, but in our view, if we take a proactive role in for example, drawing together a regional conference, bringing together powers that have a significant role to play, the allies of Syria and so on as well, trying to get them round the table to resolve the matter, you know, then that is going to take us forward. There are ways of being playing a role in the world, playing a positive global role that aren't involved with killing. Do you see it that way, uh, Brooks Newmark? This morning there was, uh, William Haig mentioned the, the Geneva conference and that would involve a role of Russia. What role can Britain play now? You know, Britain is is very good on the diplomatic circuit. Our foreign office is very strong. We're highly respected, I think, in the Middle East. And I think we should be pushing every channel possible. So the diplomatic channel with Geneva too, trying to get the Iranians and the Russians there is a fair idea. But my only question to Kate is that, you know, in negotiation 101, If there is somebody who is going to always block you, what do you do? So I'm all for negotiating with the Russians. But the Russians who are busy supplying arms, have military advisors on the ground, the Russians at the Security Council are never, ever, ever, they've had two and a half years to do this, condemn the Assad regime for A, slaughtering over 100,000 people, and B, taking responsibility for uh, the chemical attack that took place 10 days ago. At some stage, we have to say enough is enough. We have to figure out a way around 
people who continue to prevaricate and stop us doing what is necessary. But isn't aren't the concerns of Moscow justified in the sense that they want some kind of uh, you, they want to go through the United Nations. They do actually want a political settlement to this. And that, uh, in fact, they uh, expressing the views that are felt by many that helping st- changing the strategic balance on the ground will help not, not just the moderate rebels, but more Islamist allied links such as al-Qaeda and so mm. on. Again, I was out there last week. There are about 22 million Syrians, 15 million Sunnis, 150,000 free FSA fighters. There are maybe 7,500 people who are with Jabhat al-Nusra today. You cannot say you are not supporting the moderate majority in Syria because you are worried about a few jihadis on the ground. This is not Iraq. We must stop the conflating Iraq uh, and Afghanistan with the humanitarian crisis going on here. We must stop believing the disinformation campaign of Bashar Assad and President Putin. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Brandon Cole. We're discussing the British involvement in solving the Syrian crisis with Kate Hudson, James Boys, Brooks Newmark and Nadim Zahawi. Nadim Sahawi, in your comments to the Commons, you said that you'd return from a refugee, refugee camp near the Syrian border. You said that you saw British money providing food, shelter and medical treatment. Do you see a continued and perhaps uh, an increased role of uh, the UK through, for instance, organisations like the UNHCR? Very much so. Um, I saw two things. One was British money through UNHCR delivering the, the, sort of the camp infrastructure for the refugees and also some of our very good NGOs, so the International Rescue Committee, and actually in discussions with the uh, Kurdish regional government, one of the ideas they have is to create a humanitarian corridor so that NGOs could go inside Syria and help those people who had been displaced so that they don't actually flood across the border. I think you're going to see that work being stepped up. And James Boys, do you see any hope via the United Nations in terms of any kind of resolution or or help or do you see it moving more towards NATO? Yeah, because I think the problem is the United Nations are going to report on this and they're not going to allocate any blame. They'll just say what everybody already knows, which is, as Brooks rightly said, you know, that there has been a chemical weapons attack. Well, great, we already know that. What you're going to see, I think, is if this goes to the UN, uh, you'll just get a Russian veto. So I don't think the United States... And a Chinese veto as well. And a Chinese, fair enough. Let's let's spread the blame around. But uh, you're going to see a veto of any action through this and again as we were discussing earlier on you know this feeds back into the argument that the great parallel here is not necessarily with Iraq um, it's with uh, with the Balkan situation in the 1990s where again you had the Western powers particularly the British and the Americans who wanted to act in, the, in that part of the world they were routinely blocked by the, uh, the Russians in that case and so you start to see a move away from an embrace of the United Nations by the Americans towards a, uh, a more muscular approach uh, through NATO uh, which leads to I think um, the natural extent extension into the Bush administration. So if it doesn't go via the UN route, this muscular approach could work perhaps and, and we could use that example that James uh, suggested for some kind of solution to uh, Syria, do you think, Kate? No, I, I continue to think that uh, diplomatic and political solutions are the only ones which are going to bring about a resolution in the long run. I mean, Brooks rightly pointed out uh, there are very intractable, very difficult and complex situations there in the region and in terms of the allies and, and global involvement. That is not going to be resolved by uh, at the kind of strike that's being referred to. It can only be resolved ultimately by a political and diplomatic solution. And to go down the road of war at this stage, I can't see that it would end um, with the kind of strikes that are currently being spoken of. Brooks Newmark, your response to that? Yeah, I'm going to agree and disagree with you. I agree that at the end of the day there has to be a diplomatic solution to this the problem is in the absence of any pressure on the Assad regime to come to the negotiating table seriously that is nothing will happen so I think a surgical strike that has been uh, proposed which will both degrade and neutralize his military infrastructure is likely to lead to Bashar Assad coming to the negotiating table and negotiating more seriously than the absence of doing anything I think, you, I think that's right. I think you can separate out. You know, we have to act to take out the chemical weapons and nerve agent out of the theater of war of Syria. That's one distinct step that needs to be taken by the international community. Then there, there needs to be a diplomatic 
uh, and a political solution to Syria, which requires the Alawite population to feel safe enough in that country, the Christian population, the Kurdish population, as well, of course, as the majority Sunnis. Uh, and that can only happen if Russia recognizes that a, a man who's been murdering his people using nerve agent has no place to play in that future of that country. And therefore, um, you know, that's step one in, 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 in taking the negotiations seriously, that Russia and China have to agree that Bashar has to be out of the game, but the Alawite population has to be secured. And I guess, you know, now, Dean, can I just uh, can I just ask you though? I mean, you do refer you did refer in your comments to the House about the the, the fear for minorities, and if Assad is taken out of the equation, uh, there's no guarantee that, uh, that that the Alawites minorities or or any other minorities would be protected under any kind of new system. That goes back to you know Iraq and you know some of the lessons we can learn from Iraq. Iraq you know, is is a sort of photographic negative of Syria. You've got a majority Shia population with a minority Sunni, Christian, and Kurd population. Uh, Syria is a majority Sunni population with a minority Christian, Kurd, and Alawite. And I think the, the, the only sustainable solution would be some sort of a federal system for that country. But, but again, that requires the, the Syrian people to come together. You know, that, that political solution is, is, a, is something that requires attention, but that doesn't take away from the fact that we ought to act on the nerve agent and take it out of the game. OK, well, that federal uh, solution sounds a bit like Bosnia, doesn't it? It sounds like a Bosnian solution, Brooks. But it sounds like Iraq, too. Look, uh, you know, the Kurds clearly support that, that line. And having uh, been out... A, and had a meeting with the Kurdish leadership in Gaziantep uh, last week. That's exactly what they want as a federal system. But the Syria Opposition Council, which represents the vast majority of people in Syria today, represent the broad swathe of, of, of people in Syria. They represent, obviously, not just Sunnis. They represent Kurds. They represent Shias. They uh, represent uh, 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 the the Alawis as well, they, and and Christians of course. You know they represent all different groups, and I think we should not necessarily be in the business of nation building. The Syrian Opposition Council are full of of intelligent, bright, mature people. We should leave the future of Syria and nation building to the Syrian people. And just quickly, has Britain right. has Britain's standing been diminished by the vote last week, Brooks? Um, certainly. A little bit uh, with the probably the Syrian opposition. I hope not. We have a role to play. We do a tremendous amount of work with international development. We work side by side with the Americans on intelligence. Uh, certainly, they have enormous respect for us in that field. So while we may not be busy actively on the field, there are other ways in which we can help. Kate's point on the diplomatic front, I think on the humanitarian front and on the intelligence front. James Boyce, has this, uh, has this damaged the special relationship between the UK and the United States? And what will happen after the Congress decide next Monday, do you think? Uh, absolutely not. In terms of your first point, uh, as Brooks rightly pointed out, the special relationship is about a great deal more. We focus far too much upon the relationship between the president and the prime minister, which by all accounts is very, very strong in this case. But even so, you've got a very strong military and intelligence-led community. That's going to be unaffected by this at this point. And with regards to the uh, the congressional vote next week, Obama's clearly seen what uh, the prime minister has done here and decided to take a similar route. We've talked about some of the past examples uh, with regards to intervention and what is, it, what is uh, the unifying factor there has always been American leadership and at the moment that seems to be sadly lacking at this point where you get rhetoric ahead of policy and to some degree uh, political advisers being ahead of the president with regards to this and until that changes I think it's going to be difficult to see a way forward. Well that's a good place to leave it. That's James Boys, Senior Visiting Research Fellow at King's College London, Kate Hudson General Secretary for the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament Brooks Newmark MP, a Conservative MP for Braintree and on the line Nadim Sahawi MP for Stratford-on-Avon. Thank you very much for joining me, Brendan Cole, on The Voice of Russia in London. 